Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, this is a session calling uh, Loink for Beginners. So um, I think uh, many of you self-identified as such. I'm going to try to walk you through a little bit of an orientation to what Loink is all about. Uh, I'm going to do that by uh, talking kind of about four main things. I'm going to give you just sort of an overview about Loink. We're going to uh, dive into what the concept model is, that is how do we distinguish among different one codes, and a little bit of a tour of uh, sample and level of view of what some of the different data structures are. Uh, we're going to talk about the link distribution, sort of how it's published and maintained, and then we'll wrap up with just a couple of quick tips that I'll sort of plant some seeds as you're thinking about linking uh, local data, local terms to link codes. Um, before we get started, uh, I need to disclose uh, that uh, I, um, I published a book about Loink that you might hear about, uh, I don't recall if I talk about it in this session, uh, but uh, in the Realmless session in particular, uh, there's a book called Loink Essentials, um, and, uh, uh, and so um, that, uh, that's uh, one area where if you purchase it, uh, I might make some revenue, but I will mention also that all the proceeds from that book are going to a special uh, a charitable project. Um, also, uh, the majority of Loink content development and uh, development activity here at Brain Street is funded by uh, nonprofit, whether federal or um, uh, foundation sources, but we do have uh, some industry funding, uh, of which I'm the principal investigator, uh, for example, this contract with Byron Grow. Um, two main objectives that I have for today. So, when uh, we wrap up um, two main things that I'd like you to be able to do. The first is to be able to explain uh, the purpose and scope of like what is what is Loink sort of all about. The second um, to sort of set the stage for how you might make use of it, um, which is to be able to identify and select the key implementation tools that are appropriate for your particular use of Loink, recognizing that many people have different kinds of uses for Loink. So, um, in health IT today. You probably have heard this word interoperability. Uh, it gets a lot of press, a lot of attention, people talk about it, and it kind of sets the stage for thinking about the role that Link plays uh, in the health information technology ecosystem. So to start out, I want to just sort of use the HIMSS definition to get uh, ourselves oriented around what we mean by interoperability. Uh, this is, I like this definition, it's pretty simple. It basically is uh, interoperability means that it is the capability or ability of a health and IT system to communicate, exchange data, and then use the information that has been exchanged. And you can think about interoperability in a couple of different levels, at least sort of three. Uh, at a very basic level, you can just ship something from one place to the other. And the other system, the receiver, can get the data. Uh, but that's essentially it. So I sort of think of that as like the fax machine model. I can push a piece of paper, whether it's a document, an image, a handwritten note, or whatever, uh, and it, it physically moves. Okay, that's good. The second level is where we have uh, defined conventions for how that information is organized. So you can think of like when you send an email, right? You have a special box where you write the subject line, and that's different from the box where you write the body of the message. It's different from the field where you type the to and the from. Uh, email addresses and so forth. And so structural uh, level of interoperability organizes that information. But uh, the higher level is not only where you have structure, but where the content inside of that message can be uh, understood and acted on by the receiving system. And we often call that uh, semantic interoperability, meaning that uh, the, uh, the actual interpretation or the, the clinical meaning of the content can be understood by both Parties and that actually is the level at which uh, Loink sort of originated and uh, came into play. So the story of Loink uh, began with uh, Clem McDonald uh, in the uh, the mid 1990s, who was developing uh, computer-based uh, patient record systems for a long time, and started to uh, try to find ways to gather information from multiple sources. And what he wanted to do uh, was to design. Uh, an ecosystem of information systems that worked like uh, the rainforest uh, uh, canopy. So he uh, wrote this paper uh, in JAMA, which was great, uh, called Canopy Computing, where he described uh, the rainforest canopy as you know the seamless web through which arboreal creatures efficiently move to reach the edible foods. 
without any attention to the individual trees. That's the kind of system that we would like in healthcare, where regardless of where the data is produced, it can be used by the various actors in the system uh, without really paying attention to the fact that it was produced here, but now I need it uh, over here. And uh, this is, of course, a big challenge because most of our health IT systems are relatively siloed or disconnected from each other. Um, and this problem uh, is actually sort of a large one if you think about the scope of what we're trying to connect when we think about something like uh, precision health and precision medicine. So you think of the sort of scope of information from uh, basic science and genetics all the way up through patient-generated data, patient-reported outcomes, lifestyle and behavioral things, and even now, um, you know, the increased focus on social and community determinants of health. Of course, in the middle, all the traditional sort of clinical EHR-based data that uh, is, is produced, and we'd like to have uh, a seamless connection between many of these. Uh, but there's a big problem, and uh, you might recall uh, this, uh, this uh, R&B, this uh, hip-hop song from the mid-90s called More Money, More Problems. Uh, I uh, like to think of it as more data, more problems. <clears throat> the line in the song goes, you know, it's like the more money we come across, the more problems we see. Uh, but the, the problem is, you know, here in this context, we're trying to aggregate lots of different types and styles and formats of data. And really there's sort of two main problems that, uh, that come into play. The first is that um, health IT systems often lack that mechanism, they often lack that sort of structural mechanism for exchanging data. But even when they do, uh, they have lots of different ways for identifying the same clinical concepts. And that was the problem that Clem ran into uh, in the 90s as we were trying to build out a health information exchange was that everyone was calling the same thing something completely different. So if you looked in um, uh, 10, 15 hospitals around Indianapolis um, for you know the test name and the code that they were using for uh, any particular uh, lab test, and uh, I just picked uh, this one as a random example, you'll see there's all sorts of variations, right? And humans, clinicians, can look across these and say, yeah, these are the same but computers have a really hard time figuring out that these things actually all mean uh, the same and that I should aggregate them together, I should plot them on the same line of the flow sheet, I should use them in the same way uh, in decision logic uh, and so forth. So this is, this is sort of the trauma, the, the problem if you're, if you're using um, you know, your own local uh, thing. But you also notice just from looking at uh, some of those example uh, test names that there's always more than meets the eye, right? local test names tend to be relatively ambiguous or they make certain assumptions that are true in that context but are not true when you look across all the different styles of namings that people apply at different institutions um, and so that uh, that becomes a challenge and so the reality is that some of this variation contributes to the fact that today patients typically move faster and further than their health information we don't yet have this sort of canopy computing model um, because there are lots of barriers at sort of system uh, and organizational edges that prevent it. So how do we get to that sort of vision? Well, part of the solution is to adopt and use data standards. And uh, I like to say sort of simply, you know, the purpose of standards is to make data more portable and understandable to different computer systems, to computers made by different vendors. And we can think about at least these two levels of kinds of standards. One is for the syntax or the structure or the format uh, of the information. And there are a couple of different paradigms that are uh, in play today. You can think about messages, uh, the most common one being HL7 version 2. You can think about documents as a sort of syntax or format standard, the most common one being consolidated CDA published by HL7. And then last, you can think about application programming interfaces uh, APIs with uh, FHIR being the standard for that that's uh, most in play today in, in health IT. So these things are often called technical standards. They organize the format and the structure of the information. Inside of those standards are the semantic standards, which are vocabulary and coding systems such as LOINC, uh, SNOMED, ArxNorm, and so forth. And so LOINC's role is to be uh, the global standard for identifying a particular kind of health information. It is for health measurements, observations, and, uh, and documents. 
And this is what I sort of described uh, earlier in the opening. You know, it is, yes, it is a standard, but there, it actually is sort of a package of things um, being used by a diverse community um, who are contributing to its development. But at its core, we decided uh, at Reagan Street when we wanted to tackle this problem of identifying uh, health measurements, we wanted to do it in a way that promoted its widespread use because we had this idea, this vision, uh, that the more people that use the standard, the more valuable it would become. Uh, and so we've been committed to distributing and making it available uh, at no cost to lower that barrier. In the context of the semantic standards, Long scope, long focus is on uh, measurements, which is one piece, not the entire picture, one piece of this overall interoperability uh, puzzle. But uh, it's a large piece and is an important one. And today, you know, there are more than 84,000 uh, codes in LOINC that span a sort of that wide range of different kinds of, of data. So all the way from uh, genetic and molecular pathology tests um, through the sort of core of laboratory and clinical uh, measurements and data up to through uh, lifestyle and environmental things. And so there are codes sort of or, or ways of recording information um, in each of those different kinds of, of categories. When we think about LOINC, we describe LOINC really in two main uh, areas. The first uh, is, and this was sort of the, the original sort of home, the, the, the genesis of LOINC is, is the area of laboratory LOINC. And it's all LOINC, uh, but we sort of think about it in two ways, laboratory and clinical. In the context of laboratory LOINC, we think of all the things that you might measure or observe on a specimen that you sort of take out of a patient. It includes all of the usual clinical laboratory kinds of things. This world shows the relative proportion of terms that we have in each of these uh, different, uh, different areas. And so uh, you can see certainly a lot of the familiar areas. Now clinical LOINC, we essentially think of all of those things that you can measure or observe about a patient or population without like, removing that thing from them. Uh, and so in this, the realm of clinical LOINC, which is quite broad, uh, it includes traditional things like vital signs, uh, and so forth, but also patient reported outcomes measures, uh, document titles, radiology reports, uh, and a variety of other different kinds of measurements, such as those you might make on a OB ultrasound or a cardiac echo, uh, and so forth. So LOINC defines codes for those individual measurements across that whole spectrum. Uh, so codes for individual observations, body weights, you know, glucose in blood, so forth, but also defines codes for collections of those observations. Now we, we describe sort of two kinds of collections. One is a panel which has enumerated contents, something like a CBC, uh, but also more loose collections of information such as a document. Uh, and so LOINC has codes that represent, for example, a radiology imaging study report, such as a CT out of pelvis or a, uh, a hospital discharge summary and so forth. So codes for individual observations and collections as well. As I, as, as I mentioned, LOINC's role is this kind of one piece that's part of this overall puzzle. So I want to describe and illustrate a little bit how it fits in well with that uh, uh, syntax standard uh, stuff. So, uh, for example, uh, communicating a numeric result for any particular test. Um, today, lots of such uh, measurements are reported using HL7 version 2. And uh, that structure provides a basic model, which is a sort of question-answer pair for communicating that result. How many of you have seen an HL7 message before? Okay, many or most of you, okay. So this is the OBX segment. It's the, the area of the message for communicating that result. Each of those little vertical bars is just a different field. Uh, and the field is defined to be, uh, to carry a certain expected kind of information. Uh, so the, uh, the, the field that says NM is saying, that's the data type field, and it says uh, NM, that signal there means, oh, the answer, which is over in this other field, uh, OBX5, so if you count over five spots, you see, oh, that's where the result value goes, uh, and it has a type, which is numeric. Uh, and you'll notice there's a separate field um, for identifying, well, what is this measurement? That's the thing in the middle, uh, which is where the LOINC code comes into play. 
Moink is identifying what this measurement is, and then the, the actual value and its associated units of measure are carried in other parts of that uh, structure. But it's actually exactly the same thing if you were using uh, something uh, like the FIRE API standard. So it's a different format. In this case, I'm showing uh, JSON. But it's the same idea. You have sort of a, a spot that identifies what is this measurement. That's kind of in the middle here, and this is a body height thing. And I'm using a LOIN code to identify what the measurement is. And then I have another spot where I'm storing the actual result value uh, and uh, its uh, units uh, measured. So in this case, um, there's a value and the units are being reported in inches. The same kind of structure works if the result value that you're communicating is a coded uh, or taxonomic or categorical type of variable. So here's an example where I'm using uh, that HL7 version 2 structure uh, inside the LOIN code is identifying what the measurement or observation is and then the actual result value in this case is an organism being coded with SNOMED CT. So the, the CE part of this thing says, oh, my answer is going to be a coded element. My middle part here, OBX3, is the place where I'm identifying what is this observation? Oh, this line code means it's a blood culture. And the LN here is signaling that this particular code, 600-7, is coming from uh, LOIN. Now when I move over to the result value side, I see a different code coming here from SNOMED CT, but I'm identifying uh, the, the organism. So that same model, you know, uh, a, an identifier for the observation and then a spot to record the value is sort of the structure in which LOINC uh, can be used effectively, in this case in combination with other standards. <clears throat> but you might be saying, oh man, what's going to happen to all my local codes if I adopt uh, this standard, you know, I love using my local code, I love the names uh, and so forth. And, and, you know, that first presentation was uh, slightly simplified. And all of the uh, structural standards, the syntax standards, have a mechanism for sending actually both the local code and the standard code sort of simultaneously uh, together. And so you can sort of keep that, um, uh, you can keep that linkage, and most people do that through a linkage or a mapping table where you link the local code to the standard code and communicate uh, them both. Your local code can, can be used for display or drive workflow and so forth, and the standard code is what allows the downstream recipient to understand what the heck this is without having to understand everyone's uh, uh, idiosyncratic uh, codes. So how does LOINC distinguish among uh, and decide to create different codes for these kind of kinds of observations? Uh, this is uh, what the LOINC concept model and the fully specified name uh, is all about. So I want to present some uh, sort of basic things. Uh, so the first is I'll try to be consistent uh, to the extent as possible uh, when I'm describing you know, a LOINC term versus a LOINC code versus whatever. So a LOINC term you can think of as just generally a representation of a question about a clinical phenomenon that can be observed and measured, and there's two pieces to what we call a term. There's the code, which is the identifier, and a formal name, which is what defines its uniqueness in a way that humans can understand. So the LOINC code. The LOINC code is a unique permanent identifier that's meant to be the computer processable representation of a term. Uh, we assign it sequentially, so really the only thing you can understand about uh, the concept from the actual code is just some notion of its relative age. <laughs> they get bigger uh, as we go along. The penultimate character is a dash, and that final character is a mod 10 uh, check digit. But other than that, the code really has no intrinsic meaning uh, whatsoever. And once we publish it, uh, they are never removed from the database. So always be able to find uh, all the link codes that ever uh, existed. Linked to that code, we create and assign uh, LOINC names. And uh, just like uh, Dr. J had a few different names that he was uh, known by, uh, LOINC terms have uh, a handful of different kinds of names as well. But all of them uh, are meant to be sort of the visible display text of a LOINC term. The code is for computers, the name is for people. Uh, and uh, 
we do that in, in three sort of main categories. The first is the fully specified name, and its primary purpose is for being the essential defining characteristics of the term, and it's most useful for mapping. We also create a long common name, which is, uh, you can think of as the primary display name. It's the name that you would um, probably load into your database for general uh, display. We also create a short name for um, most concepts, not all of the clinical uh, concepts have a short name, but all the laboratory ones uh, do. And this is meant to be um, a sort of a, a short target, 40 characters, so thinking here like a uh, column header, uh, reports uh, label, or for old school systems that have real short uh, character limits. So those are the three main uh, flavors of long names. Here's sort of an example of what those are, and we're gonna dive into uh, the fully specified uh, name as well uh, in, in more detail. But here you can sort of see, um, for example, in the short name, the use uh, more of abbreviations and so forth, whereas a long common name is meant to be a more descriptive uh, spelled out version. So the fully specified name is designed to include all the info necessary to distinguish among clinically important differences. It is essentially what defines the essential uniqueness of each link term. So no two terms will have the same uh, link name. There's always some distinction between them, and it's the recommended name for you to sort of look at and parse for, for helping decide whether this link term is the one that I should use uh, or not. Before we describe what the name is composed of, it's also uh, interesting to note what's not actually part of the name at all. Uh, so here's sort of that list of things that we don't put inside the actual name. Uh, so the reason for the test, the actual instrument, real specific details about the specimen, um, the priority, whether the same was ordered stat uh, or its routine, uh, where it was done, who did it, the actual interpretation, essentially anything that's not essential for naming or identifying the test, we leave out of the name, right? And typically these are things that can be carried in other parts of the information model, carried in other parts of the message uh, system. Uh, so sorry, yep. that doesn't work that was done that geographical or that home? Uh, geographical. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, like location, sort of, yeah. yeah. So here's uh, sort of an example of uh, what a link fully specified name uh, looks like. So I showed you sort of the code. Okay, there's the unique identifier. And then there are six major link uh, axes. And we're going to go through sort of each one of these in detail. But first is the component, which carries the analyte of the substance that's being measured. The second is the property which describes the particular aspect of that uh, analyte, whether a mass concentration or a substance concentration. There's a timing, which uh, distinguishes between things that are done at a single point in time versus things that are, such as uh, 24 hour urine collections that are aggregated over a period of time. The system or the, uh, the specimen on which this observation is made, uh, a scale to distinguish different data types like quantitative versus qualitative and uh, the method, uh, which can be used to describe at a journal level, the, the technique used uh, to make the measurement. But uh, it's important to note that that method attribute is the only one of those that is optional. Uh, so all the other uh, attributes of the name uh, will have a value in uh, any one terms for the specified name. But here, for example, this is a body height uh, term, uh, which is methodless, we, we say. Uh, when there's no method specified, which is meant to say it could be anything. Um, uh, and uh, it's un, uh, unspecified in, in this term name. So let's walk through kind of each of these in a little bit more detail. So the component is the first part, and that is the substance or entity that's being measured, evaluated, or observed. And as an example, um, you might find in the components particular substances like sodium, uh, or glucose, or it might say something like uh, the Brucella species uh, identified. It can be antigens or particular antibodies, or uh, something like uh, body weight or body height. So it's the sort of main thing, the main analyte uh, that's being measured, evaluated, or observed. 
we actually define uh, within the overall component, so that's sort of part of the link name, there are a couple of different subparts. So uh, specifically, there are three main ones. The first is the analyte name, and that's the slot where you put that substance. The second slot is where you can uh, add in uh, challenge information. And uh, this is for um, things uh, such as chemical or physiological stimulus that are given uh, to the patient or to the sample before the analyte is measured. And so there's a little syntax that we use, for example, with glucose tolerance tests. Here's an example. You say there's one hour post 100 grams of glucose uh, per hour. So there's a little you know, time delay post and then the type of challenge structure that can be uh, added into the white names where appropriate. And then last, there are a handful of terms that use this third subpart, uh, which is uh, different adjustments. And so uh, if the, uh, the analysis is adjusted, say, to uh, a particular pH level or the patient's actual body temperature, that can be signified. I believe there are less than 100 or 200 terms that actually have an adjustment uh, specified. And so in the long-term name, those subparts are delineated by the hat or the carrot. Uh, characters. So when you look in a component, if you see a hat, that's what's distinguishing sort of the main analyte from these subparts. And if you see no hat, then it's just the analyte. The property of it is the next axis of the whole thing. And uh, this is the characteristic or attribute of the analyte that's being measured, evaluated, or observed. And as I mentioned, this is how we can distinguish between uh, several different kinds of characteristics about a particular analyte. So um, you might associate in your mind the property to the units of measure. Property is just a more general or generic sort of uh, framework for thinking about uh, reporting units. So we distinguish among things that are mass concentrations, from things that are substance concentrations, from things that are uh, mass content, catalytic concentrations or, for example, if what I am uh, describing is sort of the presence or identity of, say, an organism. Um, these things are related to all of the, um, all of the quantitative terms you can think of. Uh, if, if your reference point is the units of measure, okay, anything that has a mass over a volume is a mass concentration. So whether it's milligrams per deciliter, grams per liter, uh, whatever. Same thing for substance concentration, molar something, a, a substance amount divided by a volume is going to be a substance concentration. Uh, and this is where Loink terms are not distinguished specifically by units of measure. So there's not a different Loink code for all those different units, but it relates to a distinguishing characteristic of the name, which is this more general idea of the property. So this is a key uh, aspect for distinguishing uh, quantitative tests. Uh, it's also an area where I want to give some caution uh, because it's kind of hard to, for, for a lot of folks to kind of get their head around uh, and it's really easy to make uh, mis mistakes. So if your long-term plan is uh, mapping, uh, we're not going to go into all the, the, the nuances of the property uh, today, uh, but I want to encourage you to spend some time digging into it to understand it. And uh, importantly for any uh, quantitative measurement you'll want to choose, you must choose a line code that has a property that corresponds with that uh, even to the measure. So for example, in, in the, the book I mentioned, like Essentials, we have, I wrote a whole chapter on this property and another chapter with a bunch of uh, examples for how to use uh, the property as a distinguisher among different kinds of line codes. And there's a lot of uh, detail also in the Link User's Guide uh, about this as well. But we don't have time for all that fun right now. So uh, keep going. Timing. The timing aspect is the interval over which the observation was measured. Uh, uh, and this is primarily used in the lab context to distinguish things um, that are sort of timed collections from things that are done in a single instance. The vast majority of terms in LOINC are PT, or point in time. Uh, I don't know the exact percentage, I, uh, but there's, there's a handful, particularly in uh, your analysis, that are different kinds of timed collections. On the clinical side, the primary area where we use a timing other than PT 
is for survey instruments or patient reporting outcomes that have a look back period. So there are a lot of questions that will say, in the last seven days, how often have you felt blah, 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 or whatever. And it's that seven day look back period that is distinguished uh, in the, uh, the timing. Yes? Um, could you clarify just a little bit if you don't mind or do the or after, or just the difference between point in time or something like say leaders per minute? Like uh, the unit is per minute, but you might do it at a certain point in time or, you know. So yeah. the time aspect is not then, it's your point in time that the units are per minute. Exactly. The idea of timing is, is sort of the, um, think of it as like the mathematical integration. So your sample, your unit of analysis is a something that evolved over a period of time versus the thing that you you might be recording at a single instance, which is the, the point. So you're right, you might have a rate of some kind, uh, but that's characterized not by this big, huge like sample thing, you're characterizing it as that single instance. Like right now, it's happening at this particular rate, which does have a time, a, a time element to the unit, but uh, but the measurement itself is meant to be here and now, what is that rate? Uh, so, so, so if you're taking measurements over, say, a full two week pregnancy, yeah. so you take measure like 10 weeks, 20 weeks, 30 weeks, etc. Would mm -hmm. timing be used to say this is the point in two week pregnancy? All of those typically would be point in time because in the general structure of most information models, there is another date and time of the observation that characterizes it, right? So in the name of the test, typically we don't distinguish it. There are a handful of cases where you'll say it's the, the pre-pregnancy weight or the pre-op weight or the pre-op something. And it's not because that's necessarily the recommended approach, but it's when you have these two things that live in the record at the same instance or they're collected at the same time and you need to distinguish them that we use sort of those tactics, but that's relatively rare. Most of the time, it's distinguished by that other attribute, which is the time. So is there a way to reference sort of a live event or a medical event versus a chronological reference point? Yes. So sort of, I think, a similar question. Yeah, so... so um, they explicitly say this yeah. long after birth or something like that? Yes. Without saying when it was? Um, yeah, so there's a there's a generic way to do that, and it's kind of the uh, the word label that I describe, like pre-op, uh, which is just the context. But there is also um, a, a notion which you might have been asking about. There's a property we can use that's HX for history, meaning I'm recording it now, but I'm actually designating that it's about the past. Thank you. Right. So there's another yeah another another attribute there. One quick note here is that if you see a timing uh, that's not PT, often you'll have uh, a rate, and I'll go back to uh, sort of the urinalysis things, uh, many of those often will have a rate-like uh, property, and you can distinguish, uh, they're often correlated. All right, the next axis, the system is the specimen or the context upon which the observation was made. So for lab tests, uh, this is typically where we distinguish between uh, things that are made on sample blood or serum or plasma or tissue um, and, uh, and, and the whole host of, of uh, other different kinds of things. Now, there's one special system uh, to be aware of, uh, which is in some ways a rather unfortunate <laughs> convention, but we use, in LONIC, we use the abbreviation XXX uh, to mean a system, a specimen, that is unknown or unspecified in the test name and or otherwise indicated in a different part of the message. And I'll not go into all the detail about how and why this should be used or not used because there's a long discussion of that in the LOIC user's guide. Uh, but uh, XXX does not mean adult content. Uh, in LOIC it means uh, this uh, unknown or unspecified specimen. Uh, like the component, the system attribute has the possibility for um, another subpart. The subpart is what we call the super system. And within the, the link field, uh, if there's a caret uh, after the system and something else, the thing that comes second is the super system. For most link terms, for all link terms, we, the patient is the default super system. So if you see um, serum, and if nothing else, the fault is that it's the serum of the patient, right? 
Uh, but there are a couple of cases where we want to identify that the sample is from a source other than the patient whose record that result is being stored in. Uh, so, if, for example, uh, blood product units, or say we're, when we're making a measurement on the fetus, but that result is actually being stored in the mother's record. Uh, and so the super system is what allows us to make that uh, distinction that the measurement is about um, is from a system or a sample that's something other than uh, the patient. So again, this is optional and uh, used uh, when, uh, when needed, but not super prevalent. The scale is the attribute that classifies the result type according to a couple of different kinds of categories. Um, certainly, uh, you all are familiar with, okay, quantitative, and uh, we uh, allow that to have operators, so you can say, you know, less than uh, a certain number. Uh, but we distinguish that between different kinds of qualitative results, such as ordinal, things that are on a rank scale, for example, or uh, nominal, which are things that are categorical, uh, such as the names of bacteria, for example, or organisms. And so nominal things are, are drawn from a list, but not, uh, not sortable, not rankable. Uh, we distinguish that from uh, narrative, which would be things that might appear as, uh, say, a paragraph or a couple of sentences of prose. And uh, that is distinguished from things that are, are documents, which might be a whole collection of uh, discrete results, narrative content, images, uh, and, uh, and the like. So, yeah. so what do you do when you have a test that has a quantitative range, but it could be positive above the quantitative range, in which case it's not given a number, mm -hmm. it's given a designation above the limit of quantification. How would you handle both potential types of results in the same? Code? So there's a, there's another attribute of the structure which can be used for inter result interpretation. So high, low, normal, and so forth, which is different than when my value is say detected, not detected, or positive, negative, right? Um, and uh, in addition, there's another place to record to record what that reference range. Uh, is so we can sort of separate those things out. We can say the, the the range was this, and I can say it's above that or below that um, as an interpretation of what the quantitative thing is. But if it's a actual number, then I would use the sort of place to record the number field uh, field there. So a quantitative test could have this interpretation overall, which is above or below, positive or whatever above that cutoff. Um, last, uh, last attribute is the method. So this is a classification of how the analyte was measured or the information was obtained. And again, this is the, uh, the only optional uh, characteristic of the test name. And so we only try to designate a method if the clinical interpretation of the result is going to be different. So yes, this is a sort of a, not a bright, clear line always. But in general, what we would want to do is use the method to distinguish among things that have very different, say, orders of magnitude, uh, very different normal ranges or test sensitivities. But we want to not get into the business of specifying at a very detailed level what the method is, because there actually is another place in the message structure to record detailed technique and the instrument that was used and all of that kind of information. So we try to specify methods at a generic uh, level and I've given some examples here. So, uh, for example, IA we use uh, to distinguish amino you know, assay tests, and that's different from tandem mass spec um, and and so forth. But you'll see we use the Molgen method as a relatively generic uh, label for um, uh, molecular genetic methodologies, of which there are many. But the whole point is that none of them matter per se as far as the clinical interpretation of the result, meaning they've been standardized uh, to a point where the interpretation of what's being reported is the same. Therefore, it's not necessary to distinguish that uh, in the actual uh, test uh, test name itself. Um, so, question. Uh, you said message. I've seen a lot of hats. You, is all of this specific to HL7V2 or do you use the same syntax with your stuff no matter where it is? Um, so yeah, the syntax of the name 
is the same everywhere. So we use that little hat. We sort of borrowed that convention as a way to the limit in the name. But um, but it it would apply anywhere that that one term is used. With that one caveat that I mentioned, um, this formal name or this uh, this name with all the different parts and pieces broken out, where you see that hat, is the is the name that's helpful for distinguishing, but might not be the name you want to actually store as a display name for that right. test. Yeah. Okay. So there you have it. That is the basic concept model for how Link creates codes that distinguish among different kinds of tests. <coughs> I want to describe a couple of just two, I think, uh, advanced structures. So one is um, answer lists. So the 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 test observation. Uh, which is defined by the line code, we can associate that with an enumerated set of allowed or recommended uh, or you might consider using uh, coded answers. For, in particular, for um, non-quantitative tests, this is quite helpful. So here, for example, is a term that we created in, in collaboration with uh, CPIC, the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, where they wanted a sort of uniform way of recording an interpretation about a particular gene product uh, metabolic activity. Uh, and here you sort of see this uh, ranked categorization of whether uh, it is uh, an ultra-rapid metabolizer, rapid, uh, and so forth. And so that linked term can be linked to a set of allowed or preferred or sometimes um, just example uh, answers, and we call that structure a long answer list. Um, there's a tutorial that I'll get into that more in more detail, but I want to describe the fact that it existed, and for some terms, when you're trying to figure out, it's my ordinal thing, is, is, or is it my thing ordinal, or is it nominal, uh, how do I know, and am I doing it the same way, can I use this term? Looking at sort of this answer list often gives you sort of the more complete picture about how, uh, how a term uh, can and should uh, should be used. The second I mentioned as well um, in the fact that Link creates codes both for individual observations as well as for collections. And so there's a whole structure um, to define panels. We use the term in Link panel quite broadly to mean uh, any parent term that has an enumerated set of child elements linked to it. So in different contexts, you know, in a lab world, you might say panel, or battery, or profile. If you're kind of coming from the clinical side, you might think of it as a, an instrument, like an assessment instrument, or a form, or a data set. We use that same concept of panel, like that's our word for just any kind of collection where you have a top-level term that has a, a unique set of children. So here, for example, you know, the CBC with auto diff. So the term CBC with auto diff gets uh, a code, and underneath it there are two subpanels. Uh, one is for the CBC, the other is for the auto diff. And in turn, each of those have an enumerated set of child elements uh, linked up uh, to them as well. And uh, again, one of the other sessions uh, covers uh, panels in a lot more detail than we have time to go into today. All right, so concept model, a little bit about those two data structures, answers, and panels. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about how the standard is uh, distributed. Um, so, Link is published uh, twice per year in major releases, and those uh, occur uh, in sequence in June and December. Typically, uh, the pattern is a little bit after the meeting, the lab link meeting in June and December, uh, the, the release uh, will come out. Over time, uh, we've added a lot of content to Link. Um, this is uh, the graph that shows from the very beginning, first release published in 95, uh, the overall number of codes in LOINC uh, over time by each release. Uh, the top line there shows you know, we're at uh, 84,000 uh, or so right now. And uh, the, the orange proportion shows the number of terms that are in that uh, laboratory category with the blue portion uh, being those that come from uh, that are part of the, the sort of clinical stuff. And that's roughly a two-third to one-third split with two-thirds of the content uh, being lab tests. Now, I don't know if you would have predicted 20 years in that the curve would sort of look like this. I kind of would have thought maybe it would have leveled out a little bit. 
Um, you know, we've done sort of the hard stuff, uh, you know, this, this far in. Uh, but really, there's always uh, new things coming. So, you know, I'm, I'm amazed uh, at what continues to happen. So certainly, um, the lab IVD uh, industry continues to uh, evolve and add new tests. But uh, across a whole spectrum of other kinds of things, we also see information that was previously unstructured or recorded either in paper or in narrative form transitioning to be recording uh, more in a structured, discrete format. And it's at those points sometimes that you want and need codes for uh, this kind of uh, this content. And so we get requests for all kinds of new things as people are um, uh, are trying to share and exchange this uh, this kind of data. But all of the development is essentially driven by the Loink uh, user uh, community, meaning the content that's added, all those, you know, with each release, new codes that are, asked, are added are because uh, uh, they've been requested by a Loink, uh, a Loink user. And so uh, last year, there were about uh, 50 different organizations from 14 countries um, in the last two years, there were probably 120 different uh, organizations that uh, have requested uh, new content. <clears throat> so we distribute the standard, uh, which you can think of as sort of this table, this dictionary, uh, with records for each term, uh, but also package that with a whole collection of, uh, of resources, most of which are available uh, for free. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of them in a little bit of detail, but I'll start by talking about the, the link table, which is that sort of main uh, database. There's also the Realm of Program, which is um, a desktop mapping application. Uh, Search.link.org, which is our online browser, and a variety of different community resources, reference materials, and even um, a vocabulary server. All of this stuff is available from uh, the link website. So. A little bit about the Loink table itself, which is uh, sort of the main database content. Yeah, so um, it is essentially a, um, an API service using Fire that uh, today we use it for what was published in the very first re release of Fire terminology services, which is a way to get some value sets. So you can say, which are subsets of one codes for a particular purpose. And you can call to that and say, give me all of the, um, the top 2,000 one codes, which is a collection of one codes. And the server has a standardized way to return that back. We have plans to make a whole set of other capabilities available um, in the Fire Terminology Services API. I'm going to talk about that a little bit at noon. Um, but right now, it's kind of limited to what was the very, very worst. So just returning vocabulary back. Yeah. So when was the terminology? Is it uh, a simple list, or is, does it have any kind of launch? Um, is that three? Yeah. So there is. Uh, so terms are defined sort of in that model that I described. So there's a constant model around it. There are hierarchies built that organize the different attributes uh, of that model, uh, but it is not done from an ontologic perspective. Um, but uh, they are available. At, as uh, separate things. And the main one is what we call the multi-axial hierarchy, which combines uh, sort of the, the hierarchies for, uh, say, the analytes and the specimen, it sort of nests them together and then puts the leaf nodes as being the individual uh, white terms. Because I kind of understood that uh, you have a panel structure, which is a kind of yes. parent channel, which is already part of Exactly. Component of. Exactly. But if you have a test that might be a generic, uh, abstract concept, and for example, urea nitrogen, yeah, zero or plasma, would you have then children instances of those? That is urea nitrogen zero, urea nitrogen plasma that points to the area. Um. So there are yes. So so you're a couple of things. So one, you're correct in that part of it panel structure is, is separate from these other kinds of relationships, right? Um, not all of the relationships that you might expect to exist do exist. So, for example, we don't have a defined relationship between that serplas and then the individual serum and plasma, right. in part because uh, people are treating them as separate instances and that they're not like 
literally at the same thing. But there are some levels of aggregation that would say, okay, show me all of the codes that are done uh, on um, that's analyzed with that, uh, with, actually there is a node, there is a node that has serum plasma and blood in it. So those three would connect together under under that same node. Yeah, for example. Yeah. So the one, uh, the one, and actually, as a quick note, there the um, the that artifact that we call the multi-axial hierarchy is one of the things we describe as an accessory file, and the tutorial that covers that will go into a little bit more detail and sort of see that that structure. Yeah. The main uh, one table itself is more or less sort of this flat uh, structure, and there's two variations: the core and, and uh, the full. And uh, the core is, the, is, a, is a small subset of what we consider the, the most crucial fields that have a stable structure. And this is actually a relatively recent uh, evolution published for the first time in, in June. Um, the full is uh, the same kind of thing. There's a row for every long term, but it has a whole collection of long term attributes. I didn't even get into it, but there's like uh, 50. Uh, other attributes apart from the like name. Example, you know, measure, reference ranges, um, a whole set of other things that are part of that full thing. But many of the, say, EHR vendors and other kind of system applications didn't want to keep up with all the changes in some of those uh, less defining characteristics, and so we peeled them off into uh, uh, this core set of things that are, are quite stable and not likely to change its structure uh, over time. Now both of those tables come with a file that we call the map to file that, that define the relationships between deprecated or retired terms and those that might supersede it. So again, I mentioned you know, the codes aren't deleted or removed from the database, but they can be inactivated or retired, and there's a file that helps you navigate uh, those relationships. So both of these tables are organized one record per term, and the different attributes um, will contain things like these different names that I described, uh, a generic uh, flat classification like uh, chemistry, microbiology, and so forth. Example units, the status field, as I indicated, whether something, whether a term is active uh, or deprecated, and, uh, and other things. But then we, we package around that a collection of accessory files that add a whole bunch of uh, sort of special representations and expanded stuff. Uh, we won't go through all of these or any of these in any detail, um, but that's the focus of the, uh, the accessory files uh, tutorial to describe these. And so there's a file around parts, there's a file around uh, answers, there's the thing that defines that panels on form structure, there's special content for uh, radiology, uh, as well as our work with uh, Snowman CT and uh, so forth. And for the adventure sum, uh, each of these has a detailed readme file and release notes that describe its structure and purpose. Um, I think it's important that just kind of as we're going to go on a quick mention highlights of what the link uh, license says about what you can do with all of this content. So I'm not a lawyer, and I'll pretend to be one, but I can definitely give you the highlights of what uh, the link license says. So essentially, as I mentioned, uh, LOINC is available at no cost worldwide, and when you get today, you can use it forever. Um, it's available for use both in commercial and non-commercial purposes, meaning uh, you can use LOINC inside of an application uh, that you sell, uh, um, such as an app or an EHR system and so forth, and the license encourages uh, translation into other languages as a uh, derivative, and we have a process around uh, that translation uh, stuff um, that can be done. But there's one uh, main prohibition inside uh, the link license, and actually it's the first clause of the license. You don't even have to scroll all the way down to the bottom to see it. And that is you can't use the link or really any of the material that we publish to develop, to develop or promulgate at different standards for the same purpose that LOINC has, which is for orders and observations. And uh, why? Well, that sort of defeats the whole reason of what we're doing, right? Um, we want there to be one standard, one code for identifying this thing. So, so you can't take LOINC, you know, remove the codes, add your own codes, 
publish it and say, everybody use this new thing that's you know better terminology or whatever. Uh, that's the one thing that you can't uh, you can't do with Link. If you want to read more about kind of the, the thinking behind our approach to licensing Link, uh, there's a uh, blog post that I wrote uh, about that that goes into a little bit more detail. So I told you about the uh, the uh, the main table, um, the software application called Realma is our desktop mapping application, and uh, for those of you. I think there's a subset of you that are going to come with me the rest of the day to dive into Realma. Um, it's great. Uh, its main purpose are to provide a way to search like, um, but its real sort of shining stuff is around the workflow of mapping local codes to link codes. So there's features for importing and exporting your local dictionary, doing some transformations, uh, doing searching, making that association between this link code and link code, exporting that back out, maintaining that over time, and even submitting uh, new term requests. So um, this is kind of what the mapping screen looks like, and we'll, we'll dive into this um, uh, later uh, later today. It is a Windows-only program, so if you're a Mac person like me, you'll have to use a virtual machine. Uh, that is sort of a downside, but it is uh, well suited for the purpose it's designed for. If you want to use uh, the online browser, search.loink.org, yeah, you don't have to install anything and it's great too. It uses the same syntax as what uh, Realma does. It is always up to date. Um, you don't have to install anything. Uh, you can get to all the details about the link code uh, and so forth. But the, the really only two main downsides is just it doesn't have the mapping stuff. So there's no features in it to load in local terms and kind of march through one by one. It doesn't store your mappings. It's just like a lookup uh, sort of browser uh, type thing. But it's, uh, it's fast and, and uh, easy to use. I want to mention two more resources to help uh, with your Loink implementation. One is part of our premium membership program, and it is called the validity, the mapping validity checker. So if you've gone through the process of mapping your local stuff to Loink codes, and you want some extra review on those mappings, uh, as part of this, you can send us your file uh, with local tests mapped to Loink codes, and we'll run it through this process and return a spreadsheet that has uh, any issues that we detected uh, in the evaluation process. So what this program will look for is things that you mapped to a deprecated term. If, you, if there's a mismatch between the units that you have for your test and the relevant or appropriate properties uh, of the link code that you mapped it to, it'll pick those out. Uh, mismatches between the scale and the units that you might have. If you mapped to a, um, a concentration link term, but uh, your units, for example, don't have a denominator, it'll pick that up. Uh, and so it'll give you a whole set of things that you might want to check or double check because even the most highly trained expert mappers will make mistakes. Uh, and we've done some evaluations of sort of how and when that happens and it, it just is sort of inevitable. So you want to have a process in place to review and validate those and this can be, uh, could be part of that. In addition, I mentioned uh, to you about uh, the book, Link Essentials. Uh, if you Google that, uh, you'll, find, you'll find the site. And this was my uh, sort of two-year process to put down everything that would be the perfect handout for somebody coming to uh, this uh, session. Uh, it was designed to be uh, cover some of the basics, but give you a framework and techniques for really the hard part, which is picking out those subtle uh, but important differences between one code. Like, how do I really know if this term is right for the one that I have? As well as sort of a step-by-step -step, uh, guidance for using uh, Realm and some best practices. So um, if you want to take your link to the next level, uh, check uh, check that out. So we'll close with two quick tips uh, for you to take with you as you are trying to apply the process of choosing the right link code and mapping to one. So the first is don't make assumptions about your local term. So yeah, that would be, I wouldn't assume that that mouth is going to stay open, but this guy does. Um, so what are some of the there you can get tripped up? Well, Ambiguous test names are sort of the norm, like they're all over the place. Uh, and as a mapper, you may or may not know the details of how something is performed, but you really have to know for certain 
uh, these specifics before you assign a loin code. Of course, the units of measure can be critical for anything that's quantitative, but you'll often have to pull in local experts to review um, the package inserts or sample results and other kinds of information in order to make the right uh, choice because lab test names in particular leave out a lot of stuff. And uh, so you don't, you, you don't want to make assumptions because you will at some point be wrong. So certainly uh, sample results can help with this. For example, if you are trying to find the right length scale, um, looking at sample results can help you figure out, you know, is this thing really quantitative? Is it qualitative? Is it um, uh, taxonomic in some way? Because a lot of times local test names uh, don't, or they're not obvious. Uh, they don't make those same kind of distinctions, but it's important for choosing the right line code. Um, so, uh, so don't make assumptions. Tip two, unfortunately, this is not a one and done situation. Uh, you will have to have in your mind a plan to stay uh, up to date. And uh, the one committee itself actually recommends uh, as best practice that users update to the current version of LOINC, again, almost twice per year, within 90 days of its publication. Uh, that is considered sort of uh, best practice. Why? Well, number one, we always think that the newest release is the best one uh, because we evolve over time. But in, 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 in addition, the world moves fast. Um, certainly new tests are coming on the market all the time. Uh, and whether you are uh, adopting them or not, um, uh, you likely will be changing and uh, long changes as well, with retired terms uh, and so forth. And if you want to maximize the benefit of standardized data for um, the sort of ecosystem you're trying to serve, you're gonna have to have a plan to stay uh, up to date. But it's not just Link that changes. Um, so you might have other kinds of updates to your terms for example, you might, uh, you might add new tests, um, but what I see even more than any of that is that the coding changes. You merge institutions, you acquire this other lab, you switch your LIS, you do this or that, and your coding evolves over time. Uh, and that requires a maintenance or a management, a crosswalk to be developed. Uh, and uh, so you, you'll want to have in your, your head that this is going to be a long-term thing. And just as an example, within the Indiana Network for Patient Care, which uh, this study looked at uh, 10 hospitals around the central Indiana area. Um, when we built the information exchange, we mapped all the stuff that these hospitals had. And then we looked two years out. Of all the things that we had mapped, how did that change over time? What we found is half as many terms appeared in that two year period. So 50% of the tests like turned over or changed in the two years after we went live. So it's this constant sort of churn that has to be continually updated uh, over time. And uh, so you want to know about that and plan uh, over time. So that was it, my two top tips. I've got actually a bunch more if you want to look uh, at another blog post, uh, my website slash tips, uh, you can go uh, there. But uh, that is it, and I think we've got some time for, uh, for questions. Yeah. So. The typical use of mapping, this is like three questions, okay? okay. I'll try to answer I'll try. them all at once. Yep. The typically used uh, where there was no coding system or where there is a coding system existing already that was completely proprietary maybe, and uh, is it used often for conversion to internal use of the link? Uh, and, and how long is it? Is it a big deal when somebody comes up with something new to get a code for that? Or do they have to come up with a local one first and use that for a while? Mm -hmm. And uh, I forgot the third one. So I might have been four already. No, um, <laughs> those are all good ones though. So uh, in my experience, the primary use is where somebody has already an existing catalog or dictionary of tests that is proprietary, or local, or idiosyncratic. They almost always have something existing that they're then trying to link up to. Is that, is that vendor specific often or institution specific? Institution more? specific. Okay. So vendors will have, you know, any of you can so speak up if you know a different experience. Often vendors will have a starter set, you might call it a model or a beginning thing, but uh, today this wasn't the first time anybody had a system, so they had something before they had the one that they had now. So they often, they might migrate or change over time, but they also tweak that 
set over time. So there might be a template that they start with, but then they add their own labels or they do this or that. And so it's not, it's not even as though all Epic users or all you know, Orchard LIS users have the same coding. It's like every institution already has sort of a different, different list. So you're correct in that that's sort of what people are starting with. What they want to do is, okay, so that other people don't have to know about my internal local stuff, I'm going to map to the standard. Do they then convert or migrate yeah. in some way to using like as the primary? Right, and what do they do with the lag between something they have to do and having yes. a link for it? So most of the time, and the standard always sits alongside something else for actually a variety of reasons. First is, um, they want to tailor the display name uh, for their purposes, right? And so they do that as an association. They link the local code to the one code and they use them together, but they can tweak that name. Um, the second is uh, that Blink won't have a code for absolutely every node. Right. The sun in there are these local things. So in general, it's actually good to have a mechanism to extend in the ways that the standard can't or won't adopt. And it, that happens for all kinds of reasons. Things that are internal QA purposes that they still need to code for but are never reported outside. They want to make a distinction that one by policy is decided it's not going to make. Like all those, all those things happen. Um, so yes, inevitably there will be, uh, and we've shown it in the graph, well, there's stuff Link is missing. Um, and is it easy to request a new term? Yeah, it is. Uh, and we're happy to make new terms. Um, in general, it's about 90 to 100 days or so from the time of request to uh, a line code. We pile one more yeah. one. You do find when, when people use proprietary codes, are they usually getting an OID or a fire or using a fire compatible sort of domain name or their code system identifier or are they usually not? Um, they are, uh, so I guess it spans things. So they are using a code system. They are using name, a code system. It has doesn't have to be registered either. Exactly. Or so mostly not. No. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So exactly, like when you look in, like there is something in that code system field, but you will have never seen or known about it before. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, this is about the same tests using different tools. Mm -hmm. So for example, the blood glucose measure you use most for the blood glucose and measure it for the Yes. Are those two different codes? Yes. So what what Link distinguishes are um, two things. First is, at the level of property, there is a distinction between, uh, you say milligrams per liter, and so a mass versus a substance. Yeah. Those are different. In general, any uh, mass per volume for the same analyte, same system, everything, would have the same light code. So it's not required that somebody uses a specific or particular kind of unit to use that light code. Sure, there are conventions where most people might say there's a preferred unit of some kind, but Link isn't declaring or, or binding that unit thing. There are, I would say, some subtle implications of units that come up in this other thing that I talked about, which was method. So there are some cases where um, the units are different, but it's, actually, it's a phenomenon of something else. And so, for example, um, uh, 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 tumor marker uh, studies versus regular ones have way different ranges and so yeah the units might be different but there's actually sort of something else going on which is why people want to sort of separate those that's not a general rule all the time but there's a sometimes there's a signal in the units they might say okay if there are orders of magnitude different in the units we we might want to look at uh, a different code to distinguish that but in general, it's not specifically the units that are driving that distinction and different codes. Does that answer? Uh, so in a sense, you, you might have to have two different codes for the same test. Yes. Yes. Not necessarily all the Yes. Okay. That's true. Yep. Yeah. And we're um, stay tuned for further conversation around this project we're calling groups, like groups, to help bring together. Uh, those two different tests that may be distinguished by that property, including 
sort of this, not a totally a long shot, but a vision towards uh, enabling places where you can do automatic conversion, say if you do the molecular weight, you could do that in a conversion. Um, so it's it's actually, I'm thinking of that as, a, as an add-on to the standard distinction, meaning we're not gonna change how we create different codes or the distinctions we make, but we might build some additional things that help people navigate those cases where they're the same. Yeah, or, or convertible uh, in, in some way. Yeah. Um, what would you do with, uh, say, two medical devices, two, two tests uh, that have uh, the same analyte, the same method, the same units, but different uh, reportable ranges? Say one is more sensitive to the app than the other. Would you have a different light code, or would you have similar light codes? Um, great question. The, the, sh the shortest answer is, in general, those would largely be the same, but there are some special cases. So tomorrow at the committee, we'll have a great discussion about this. For example, high sensitivity troponin tests, uh, and this whole like evolution of. Um, you know, generations of testing that may or may not have sort of true or meaningful differences in interpretation like over time is a little bit of a fuzzy line. But for example, you know, if the test was approved in the context of saying, like this other one that was already approved and so forth, we would tend to have the same line code for those and not make different codes per manufacturer, even though there might be small variations in those characteristics, but that is not, it's not like a forever principle and there's these edge cases that come up and are worthy of discussion. Yeah. I would see where that, having that distinction would be really uh, rich and valuable for clinical research. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and again, there are other ways, so our, our guiding principle too is like, what we're trying to do is make codes that distinguish uh, along these key attributes recognizing that there's other information always in this in this model this information model about the exact instrument that was used you know even you know make model serial number like all those kinds of things and the testing characteristics that can be stored around that result value for such purposes our goal is do we need to have that distinction in the test name or not so that's the trick yeah. okay. I, I was something related about like the that could be used, I'll say, as a bundle, a collection, to come alongside a primary result measure that could give you additional data about the instrument. The question is, do you have like a whole collection of these other related variables that come along, or do you find the spots in the structure of the message to store that? So right now, there are fields that you could use to write all that or, or describe it in narrative or whatever. People typically aren't doing that. Um, or aren't doing it in like a reproducible way where the receiver can really dig back in. So that's definitely an area of ongoing sort of dialogue and discussion about what's the best way to structure that kind of information. Yeah. How do you do with uh, obsolete or decorating? Uh, burn them, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Um, so uh, so uh, terms can have a status or state, um, active being that there are um, two sh uh, shades of active that are not quite deprecated. So we have terms that can be labeled as trial and terms that can be discouraged, which uh, can be used in cases where um, current practice no longer suggests that this is really a code you should probably be using. But it wasn't erroneous and it's not invalid in that way, but we want to give a signal to people that they should probably think twice before mapping to it. Those three are active. Deprecated is retired. Uh, when a term is retired, its status is flipped, 
is given a reason, a description of that, and wherever possible we make a direct linkage, an association between a, a superseding term. Occasionally, there are multiple possible superseding terms because it was it was ambiguous. That was why we deprecated it, because it, it was mixing up two things, right? And so the user should be choosing between one of uh, one of these two more specific accurate terms. And so that uh, that's maintained in the structure, and we try to follow uh, what we would consider to be best practices in terminology management, which were not um, we're not altering or editing terms over time in a way that would change their meaning. Rather, it, when that comes to play, we would deprecate a term and create a replacement. So that's the sort of general principles we use, but it's part of the, the modeling. Yeah, it's like the, uh, the language is, I understood from your introduction that is there flowing in different languages, because it was there one in string? Yes, there are, um, there are 18 uh, translations into 12 different languages. So presumably there's some kind of way for the same one to have Yes, languages. correct. So is there a way to navigate? Yes. Yes, we um, there are. We we treat uh, language translations differently than other kinds of synonyms. But yes, all of those the, all of those things are part of the record that you can you can traverse. Good. I think I'll take uh, one more, and we probably I want to give you time to switch between uh, your sessions. This was fun, but we got to move on. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you have uh, 90 to 100 days for, from a request to approval of code. Um, does that mean that uh, if I request the code in January, I can expect that the code is uh, approved in March? But I cannot use it before the next release, right? So in uh, worst case, I have to wait half a year uh, if I can use that code. Yes, so um, the, the number I quoted was uh, what I call the median turnaround time. So. Mm -hmm. It's the most consistent uh, right, number of days that it takes for any particular request to get returned back to the requester. So our policy is, uh, once the term has passed the, the QA process, the requester of that term gets the new ID, the new line code that was created, back to them, and we publish it on a pre-release page of the link website. So it is available for viewing, browsing, people can see it, so we don't get multiple requests for that same concept over time. But the expectation is that the user community is not looking there every single day to find the new codes. Um, typically, the cadence that people want to update around is that six-month period. But, for example, there's nothing you are you as the requester are free to use that code, say, in your system, or if you're writing a document that's referring to that in some way, um, that's allowed. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Uh, we've got uh, time till you've got about ten minutes to make it to your next uh, to your next session. Thanks.